Tim Quas, good morning. How are we doing, sir? Guys, great to see you. Greetings from Steamboat Springs. How how we how the market treat you last week? It was a, it ended up being a good week overall. Somehow, some way. How are you doing out there? Well, here's here's what I think, uh, and it's going to require some sacrifice for one of us. <laughs> um, ever since ever since uh, I went to the Caribbean, Karen and I went to the Caribbean end of January. And of course, uh, the market soared after after dropping, and uh, and the snow showed up in Steamboat. And ever since we came back, the market has been miserable, and uh, it stopped <laughs> snowing. So I believe we're going to have to draw straws and, exactly and see who's got to go to the Caribbean so we can get this market corrected. Uh, oh, that and that sounds like a pretty bad punishment to have to go <laughs> to the Caribbean here. Right. <laughs> You're like hoping for the short yeah. straw, straw on this one, aren't you, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> and to answer your question, Spencer, you can see I've got some pretty good sun, and uh, so the okay. I was hanging out on the slopes and uh, and by and large okay. staying away from the market because remember we talked about this. Uh, back on February 22nd, I said, if you look at the market for about 10 days, uh, market structure will tell us it's not going to be a good place to be. Now, we're getting very close to the end of that, uh, the turning point. And so often for, for uh, retail traders, we, we, unfortunately, we tend to be late, right? We, we, about the time things are improving is about the time that we leave. And I'm hoping that these, these Monday discussions that we have will, will help folks come to understand the cycles that occur in the marketplace. And I, I caught a little bit of your Kathy Wood discussion. And I think there's uh, something important to understand about exchange traded funds. You know, she's run this very successful uh, family of ETFs. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I was going to ask you about it anyway, but keep going. Okay. Okay. So it, there, there, there's a, an important concept to understand about ETFs and they have an advantage that we don't. And they're going to do things periodically that most of us can't. So one of those key things is that they can wash out capital gains. So you can, you can use what's called the redemption basket. You were talking about uh, S-E-E-R, Dennis, and yeah. this could, could, you could apply to Tesla, uh, Apple, Facebook, Google, yeah. all of these things that have had extraordinary performance. So if, you're, if you want to redeem ETF shares and realize she had some outflows, uh, a couple of billion dollars of outflows. So what she will do is put in this basket there's it's like a shopping list. And so into this basket will go names of stocks and she will push those out through the market through what are called authorized participants. And, and those will be traded for shares of ARKK and, and maybe other members of the family. And, uh, and when that happens, she is able to reduce the tax consequences for the ETF. Then when she brings them back, they will be brought back at a stepped up basis and she won't have to pay taxes on those. You and I will still have to pay taxes on the performance of the ETF shares. Sure. But I think a lot of that is going on. I think it's occurring across the market because keep in mind, uh, tech, consumer uh, discretionary and communication services combined are over 50% of market cap. And it's and consumer discretionary and communication services are not. There's a lot of tech in there. Consumer discretionary includes Amazon and Tesla. Communication services has Facebook and Google. And so if these parts of the market go down, I don't care how well, you know, GameStop does or GE or the 2.5 percent of the market that is comprised of energy stocks that cannot possibly carry the market to new highs. It requires those major engines of the marketplace. And when this process of washing out capital gains has run its course, then those stocks will come back. I, I will, there is a qualifier, but that event is coming. We have quad witching coming up, not this week, but next week. And I Good expect point. this process is going to be done by then. That's my expectation. Tim, what do you make of, of the, the, the rising hullabaloo of the ARK Invest uh, liquidity risk right now, uh, and the, the the idea that they're getting so big in a number of uh, less liquid stocks that should they receive a waterfall of outflows, 
yep. then that would open them up to some to some serious problems and and potentially having to trade at at, at massive premiums to, to NAV. Could happen. Okay. Uh, the 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 uh, the advantage, though, again, here's so here's point number two with ETFs. And I had this conversation, by the way, with the BlackRock ETF team about three years ago, after we had done about three years of research trying to understand how these instruments work, because it's actually very complicated. They seem like mutual funds that trade like stocks. There is no such thing. A mutual fund regulated as an investment company act, 19, investment company act of 1940 uh, fund has to give everybody the same price. Therefore, there can only be one price per day. So how could an ETF offer prices throughout the market? Well, by offering a substitute. ETF shares trade as a substitute for the assets of the fund. That's the only way it works. So an ETF will create a basket and say, here's the stuff we will require or will accept uh, in order to create more ETF shares and vice versa. Well, they could substitute. If uh, So what Kathy Wood could do is say, okay, I'm looking for the fangs, but I'll also take cash in lieu. And the BlackRock team, I said to the BlackRock team, uh, okay, so you would take cash in lieu of, of equities? And they said, yes, and we'd over collateralize it. So 105% probably. I said, could Morgan Stanley write you a check for the basket? And they said, we take good collateral. Uh, so the, to, to answer your question, yes, but in as that fund grows, I, I expect that they will use more cash in lieu and less stock to try to control that risk. It's entirely within uh, the, the legal uh, uh, limitations that these funds are allowed to do. And it won't show up as cash on the book. It will show up as whatever the equity is that that is in lieu of. So it will be Tesla or Facebook, but it'll be a bunch of cash. Well, that works so long as the market doesn't move too dramatically. You know, cash has very sustainable value, uh, but a big move could be trouble. Sure, this could happen to the whole market when you think about the tri $5 trillion tied to ETFs. It's just that, I just fine. want to hop in. Tim, is, <laughs> is, is, this, is this process been done before by somebody else, and how did it end up? Oh, sure. Yeah. It, uh, the, the, in fact, there was a fund two weeks ago. The, the name of it, it escapes me, but they had to close it to redemptions because of some dramatic moves in the parts of the market that it's exposed to. Sure, it can happen. These ETFs, remember, are dependent for prices on volatility. There is the volatility of the basket of stocks and the ETF shares. And in order for market makers to participate, to say, we will take the risk of buying and selling these things, there needs to be predictable volatility. When it becomes unpredictable, and I think this is also a problem in the market that's beginning to manifest. When it becomes unpredictable, then a big market maker like Morgan Stanley or Jane Street or Citadel is going to run a calculation and say, uh, we're not taking a risk on that and they stop making a market in it. Well, one party removes itself from the equation and you can get destabilization. And it is something I'm concerned about and I'll show you when we come around to a little bit of data. I mean, this is what we saw mm -hmm. during the flash crash. You know, this is what we saw right. during the, yep. the two flash crashes, really. There's the May, May 6th one of 2010 and then the 2016 one, which doesn't get as much highlights, but it's definitely the yep. same, same animal cut from the same cloth that yep. we've got all of our liquidity being provided by a select amount of market participants with no affirmative obligations. And yep. if going gets tough, they pull their bids and we're left with nothing. Exactly. I mean, this is, yep. you know, the market that we have though. Right. So 99 percent of the time it operates very well. 99.9% right. .9 of the time. And then you get these little, you know, <laughs> instances where risk gets elevated to a certain level. The market maker gets too heavy and they're like, okay, we're out. <laughs> exactly. That's, and look, you can't blame them. And 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 I'm not, uh, you know, fostering fear here. I don't worry about that because we we here we understand market structure. And I think it's important for if you're going to be a trader in this market, you need to understand it too. But you don't have to be afraid of it. You just have to realize that it has limitations, and they're going to manifest as volatility increases. And so we hit a 52-week low in volatility February 12th. I mentioned this last. Last time we were on, that's the same day, by the way, the Chinese stocks topped for the year, same day fangs topped, same day that the general tech sector topped. And ever since then, 
things have begun to deteriorate and volatility increases. And so what you have to know as a trader is there are like eight parties that are responsible for almost 90% of customer orders. That's crazy. Uh, so, so you have to realize that that can become a bottleneck. And what you want to protect yourself from is, well, where will the bottlenecks show up? Well, they'll show up where all the market cap is. <laughs> Though if 50% of market cap is tech, communication services, and consumer discretionary, they're going to struggle if there are redemptions, and you need to know that. So when you look at your, you know, where, how sentiment is moving in the market, when those things top, reduce your exposure to them uh, because they could become, they, they could crumble if things really start accelerating. Let's take a look, you know, just that. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's go look at, you know, and get your thoughts first on the overall market. We've had a significant week of volatility yeah. here. Um, obviously, we look like we had a washout low on Friday in the queues. Can you give us, you know, just your market structure look, you know, maybe on the queues yeah. here? Because they really got hammered. They had a nice snapback rally. What's your market structure? Um, what, what's your what's your system saying? Well, let's uh, let's pick a couple of examples <clears throat> just yeah. to just to illustrate where yeah. things are. So let's take GameStop. You know, always fun to talk about. And remember, I said that it looked pretty appealing. I made money trading GameStop in the last couple of weeks uh, because market structure was very appealing. But now I look at it and say, it's a ten out of ten. Ten is the ceiling. One is the floor. And it's simply a measure of supply and demand. When you're bouncing against the ceiling, that's good demand. But it also means people are going to begin to struggle to fill their orders. And, and you need to be aware of that. Plus, it's 57% short. It's topped. Uh, and active money is in here. Active money is often the sucker. <laughs> right? So I would look at GameStop and say, if you've been trading this thing, no matter there's, you know, we're, there's some, some interesting rumors this morning about uh, – the role of one of the board members there <clears throat> to try to improve the outlook for, for GameStop. But I would look at this from a market structure stand, uh, standpoint and say, well, it's bouncing off the ceiling and short volumes above the trend, I'm out. Now, conversely, look at Moderna. You know, Moderna is the exact opposite. And these are just a couple of touch points of the market. By the yeah. way, if you want to follow along and do the same thing, uh, uh, traders, go to marketstructureedge.com. You can set up a portfolio for free, no credit card, and you can see what I'm talking about here and how simple it is to just look at, at uh, market structure. When Moderna is at a 10 out of 10 and short volume is below trend, stay. The moment those things begin to deteriorate, sentiment begins to fall, short volume pops above trend, get out. It's not, it's not that complicated. And when it, now it's bottom. Now I'm watching this. I'd like to yeah. see short volume back right in line with trend, but this tells me the next opportunity is going to be in the in the Modernas. These that's the way the cycles run. They're very short term, and they're for the same reasons we just discussed. Uh, ETFs and indexes will get overweight, and they'll underweight themselves. Options will expire. We'll hit the month end, and people have to true up their futures contracts. And those things create cycles that you can that will manifest in sentiment like this. So, looking at tech, Dennis. Uh, you know, if we, we talked about Palantir, I'm looking at tech and tech is starting to get very attractive. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's, oversold. Up, it's, it's oversold. way oversold. Right. And I think money is going to have to come back into it. There is one concern that I have broadly, and that's here. If we look at the broad market sentiment, S&P 500, we use SPY as the, as the proxy for that. Here's the issue. This is measuring the overall waxing and waning of supply and demand in the S&P 500. <clears throat> so, you know, when it <clears throat> we've dropped down to the green line here, that's a sign that we'll probably get a surge. <clears throat> Here's the peak right about, you know, right about that. To, it was the 18th for the S&P Y. It was about the 12th for overall tech. Now we've been at the same level for four days running. My, my question is, is that a bottom or is it a top? If it's a top, very a very weak top, I'm very concerned about the fact the market could correct. That's that condition has preceded every market correction over about the last ten years. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's the one threat, and I think it would sort itself out fairly quickly <clears throat> heading into quad witching next week. But that concerns me. I'm definitely not coming back into tech until I see that improve. But Moderna Let's, could be very attractive. 
What about Exxon Mobil? Because this has been a real run. This is where people have been hiding from the tech wreck. They have jumped into yeah. energy, hand over fist. The right. stock Exxon Mobil, which everyone hated back in November when it was $33, has almost doubled to $61 yep. here. What's your market yep. structure show on Exxon Mobil? 10 out of 10, top 55% short. We're, you know, that tells me that the, the, the wild card and people don't talk about it enough. Look at that. I mean, it's been at the sea. It's been, this has been, this is what Tesla used to look like. <laughs> you go back to, you know, May of last year and Tesla was slamming into the ceiling like this. Yeah. And so, but look at short volume. So if we're looking at a three month period, a very good stretch of time to look at, it's at a 10, but short volume is massive. And so what this will tell us is that high frequency traders, the citadels of the world know that money is overweight Exxon. It's overweight energy. It doesn't mean energy is going to fall apart. Energy will be driven by the dollar. As long as the, as the dollar point. is weak, I don't care what happens at a Saudi uh, you know, a refinery. I don't care what else happens. If the dollar strengthens, energy will de decline. If it remains weak, the energy, the oil prices are going to remain strong. That still does not mean that all these funds are not going to reweight. And I think they're going to reweight right into quad witching. And that's not this week, but next week, because look at the short volume. It's telling us that high speed traders think supply is going to come into the market and they want to be on that side of the coin. And that's what it's telling us. So you'd be taking profits in stocks like that right now? Abs absolutely. Yep. That's just a very simple mathematical uh, conclusion. Yep, no emotion at all. Just look at the short volume and the yeah. sentiment. Get out. Yeah. All right. Tim Quas is the founder and CEO of Modern IR and Market Structure Edge. Joins us every Monday for Market Structure Mondays. Tim, we always appreciate it. Thanks a lot, sir. Good to see you guys. Have Alrighty. a good day.